Well, it takes you about an hour to, get, to see the whole thing. It's in the middle of the desert. It's got a, all that, okay? And one of the things you like about it, um, and it's free, but if you're going to go there, it is a true monastery, all right? And it's their thing. They can do anything they want. You dress their way, all right? Do not have red fingernail polish. You won't be allowed in, and it's their, their deal. They can do that, and you better be covered, and on and on it goes. It's their deal, right? Um, and you can't talk loud because they are walking around and doing what mon monks and what are female monks? Anyway, whatever they do, right? <laughs> but it's really, really, really cool, and you want to go there and just do it in the middle of the desert. But one of the things, see that bottom line? They're very big on one thing. We've been Orthodox since 33 AD, implying what? If you're not us, you deviated. So they have a chart of church history. It starts with, you know, Pentecost, and there's this line, that's them. And everything that came off it, right, Roman Catholicism, Protestant Reformation, you deviated from truth. And so they're very, 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 very big on that. Orthodox since 33 AD. So today, um, why did I start with that? Because as we go to this next section in church history, we see the rise of so many things. In fact, as, uh, even as I thought today and as we prayed, you know, you look at church history, and it seems like the only guys who don't get written about are true believers. <laughs> you know, it's always about everything else. And after a while, you just say, I don't want to be a part of any of this stuff at times. And other times you see some really great things, but you realize God is always building his church. So I want you to start with it. Orthodox since 33 AD, and that will be demonstrated as we go through um, some of the things we do today. So I got a question for you. Do we want the United States of America to be a theocracy? Don't answer them yet. To officially be a Christian nation, to have a Judeo-Christian worldview? And I'm not asking for an answer. I just want you to think about it and uh, really want you to think about this. A theocracy is that, that uh, and that's what um, the guy out of Iowa is trying to do, actually set it up, that God's law is the law of the land. All right, is that what we want? Okay, God's law is the law of the land, right? Um, a Christian nation is a different question that uh, we are a Christian nation, right? Or a Judeo-Christian worldview. That's another question, and th your answer might be yes, no, no, or no, yes, yes, or whatever it is. But as you think about it, I think sometimes when I dream, wouldn't it be great if we had a theocracy? <laughs> wouldn't it be great if we were a Christian nation? Wouldn't it be great if we had Judeo-Christian worldviews? And a lot of those answers are yes, 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 right? But when you think about it from church history perspective, how would we know what would be good for us? Okay, So the section we're on today may help us, because when you study church history, you see what happens when the church is the official religion of the world. Is that a good thing? The official religion of our country is Christianity. Would that be a good thing? Or did our early church fathers say, no, 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 no. We are going to separate church and state. You know, is that a better way to go? So anyway, we're going to think about that. I want you to think about that. Um, also, I know church history is like drinking from a fire hydrant. And you always have to, you know, if you see, see my notes, I used to teach it in a Bible institute. So, uh, you know, what I give to you in an hour, I used to do, give to the kids in about I call them kids because they were only 20, you know what I mean? And uh, I'd give it to them in, in three to six hours, and then they'd get a quiz at the end of it. So we just got to go fast, all right? I, don't want, I could spend an hour on every person and whatever, but we don't do that. We're going to go like that. And I wanted you to remember the Church, his, church in History by B.K. Kuyper. And next week, hopefully, I'll have a little booklet for you to buy, uh, um, 2,000 years of church history. It's a little booklet. has it all. So we're going to review a little bit. Church history is divided into three sections, ancient, medieval, and modern. And last week, we did the apostolic church real quickly 
from 30 to 100 A.D. when finally the apostles were all dead. It's called the Apostolic Church from Pentecost to Patmos, and some things were now true. But we studied mainly last week the persecuted church from Patmos. Now the apostles are all gone. Uh, to Constantine in 325, when we'll figure out why 325 is important in just a minute. And some things have changed, all right? So you're constantly seeing change coming, all right, as you go. So as you get to Constantine, where the persecuted church ends, what's going to happen? So suddenly we're in a new era. It's called the popular church or the state church from Constantine to Gregory. From 325 to 590, and it's from the uh, Constantine, who didn't uh, establish Christianity as a state religion. He did not do that. That's a misnomer of many people. But he did make it a legal religion, and he did make it a promoted religion. He just didn't quite make it the official langu- uh, religion of the, of the state. So here's what happened. Constantine was co-emperor with Galerius in 306. Galerius issued an edict of toleration in 311. So when you can't beat them, you have to join them, right? right? And they've been trying to beat down those Christians forever. And finally, by 311, they figure, you know, we can't beat them, so we better join them. And so they make an edict of toleration, which meant all religions are tolerated, including Christianity. So that's, that's a good step for the Christians, because suddenly now it's not an illegal thing. Uh, in 312, Constantine, who was co-emperor with Galerius, defeats Maxentius at the Milvinian Bridge. And it was there, that you remember in church history, that he had, supposedly, perhaps, we don't know for sure, but in history it's recorded that he had a vision of the cross. (laughs) Go forth with the cross. And so he went and he won, and he said, it works! (laughs) We're following the cross. And so uh, that was a moving event, apparently, Uh, We are not sure that it actually happened, but that's what church history tells us. And so that's when he shifted and he said, Christianity is it. The cross is it because go forth with the cross. And he won in that particular battle. He wasn't supposed to win. So by 313, there's a new co-emperor, Licinius. And together they make the Edict of Milan, which is different than the Edict of Toleration. And now Christianity is even more legal, but now it's promoted. So by 324, he becomes the sole emperor, and he prom- promotes Christianity. So that we often say the popular st- church started in 325 when he'll make the edict that says Christianity is uh, not the official religion, but it's the one he's doing. And now the emperor is a Christian, and he was converted and, and all those kinds of things. So now, if you want to follow the emperor, you don't have to say Caesar is Lord, you have to say Christ is Lord. The whole thing's flipped there, right? So now it's very popular to be a Christian. Wouldn't that be great if it was popular and everybody wanted to be a Christian, right? So when we lived in Africa, it was interesting to me because they think more, we think individually, that's the way we as Westerners think. And in uh, other cultures, they think group. So if you went into a village and the chief was saved, everybody got saved. If he was baptized, everybody lined up. Because the chief got saved. The chief got baptized, we're getting baptized, right? Right? So you went to church, and everybody went to church because the chief went to church. And so from a Western perspective, to me, it was like, no, that didn't work. <laughs> you know, I don't think everybody accepted Jesus as their Savior, but everybody's following the chief. And so you had to sort that out, and God ultimately had to sort it. But everybody in our village went to church. On Sunday morning, everybody went because everybody followed the chief, Right? So is that good or bad? You know, I don't know. Part of it's good, part of it isn't good, all right? So let's just think about the popular church and some of the changes that are going to take place in this period of time from 325 Constantine to 590 Gregory the Great, the first significant pope. The new status, they went from illegal to legal, okay? So now the church is a state church. That will actually happen in uh, not 325, but 381, 
when uh, the next or the third emperor after actually makes it the official religion of, of, the, of, the, of the Roman Empire, right? They're going to have a new capital. Instead of Rome being the capital of the Roman Empire, there's going to be a shift. If you remember the Mediterranean Sea, Rome, of course, is in Italy. If you go to the Black Sea over there, Asia, it's called Asia, Turkey, we think of it. Istanbul is the city we think of today. So the new capital is going to shift for the Roman Empire, is going to shift from Rome to what we call Istanbul today. So as a result of that, there's a new status, there's a new capital, there's a shift from west to east as far as the Roman Empire is concerned. And because now Christianity is a part of that, or eventually the official religion of it, that, you know, there's a shift in, in where Christianity is going to be. So they're going to build a new church there. In 537, the Hagia Sophia, or the Sancta Sophia, is built uh, in what we call Istanbul, Byzantia. It was a massive, massive structure by Emperor Justinian I, who made Christianity the official religion. In 1457, the Muslims and the Turks conquered that area. So now they have this beautiful, great, huge structure called the Hagia Sophia, the Holy Church of Wisdom, right? And so they changed it into a mosque. And that's why today when you go there, you have the minarets, and it's a mosque. So, but everything's shifted. So the popular church is that period where illegal to legal, or ultimately to state, Rome to Byzantium, the Sancta Sophia becomes the dominant big church in, town, in, in the whole Christianity, and it's a structure now. So even if you study church history, you realize that initially there weren't structures, right? There were, you met in houses, and you can read that in the book of Acts, but eventually they started building structures. And in this period, um, they will really build church buildings all over. And it will be in, in honor of, you know, Mary or whoever it is. So you can go to Ephesus, and there's the, the, the ancient ruins of the ancient church to, in, in honor of Mary and those kinds of things, and John and whatever it might be. So they have new church buildings, and they're usually big and impressive because everybody's going. You've got to have big and impressive buildings for all that. But there's a new challenge that's going to happen as well through this time because there's now a rivalry between, that's going to develop between the East and the West, between Rome and Byzantium or Istanbul, between uh, the Roman side of Christianity and the Eastern side of Christianity. So next week, Lord willing, if we come, we're going to go from the first pope to the great parting. In 1054, the church is going to split east and west, okay? But there's a rivalry. And as things have been developing, the, remember last week we said in, uh, at near the end of the persecution, there, the, the bishops are becoming more and more powerful. So initially there was bishops and elders and pastors, that's one person, and then the deacons, right? But now they have the hierarchy, and the bishops are ruling over their church, but in a region, the bishop of the big church in the region is ruling over the other bishops in the region. And in the big cities like Rome and whatever, that bishop, well, he's, he's the first among equals, as they said. So he became the most. But who's the, who's the biggest bishop? Who's the most important? Is it the bishop in Rome? Or is it the bishop in Byzantium or Istanbul. And so you can see, as you study church history, there's this rivalry between East and West that we actually know of today as the Western Church, Roman Catholicism. And out of that came the Protestant Revolution, Reformation, I should say. And then on the Eastern Orthodox, and uh, maybe someday we can do a study of Eastern Orthodox, they just totally think differently than Roman Catholics. So if you say to a, an Eastern Orthodox, tell me what you believe, they'll just look at you like, what are you, nuts? They don't know what you're talking about. You say, well, just tell, do you believe in the deity of Christ? And they're like, what are you talking about? What's your doctrinal statement? 
what are you talking about? They literally don't know what you're talking about. Western was very rational. And we have doctrinal statements, and we believe in the deity of Christ, and we believe in da-da-da-da-da, that's what we believe. Eastern is, um, we might call it more mystical, they would not like that word, but they're a little less, we don't have doctrinal statements. I don't know. What do you mean, deity of Christ? What's that all about? I don't even understand the question. But they really focused in on, as we'll study today, on the creeds, the councils, like the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed, right? And so their whole thing is, we believe all these creeds. What do you mean? So instead of a doctrinal statement, you know, we believe, da 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 they have, we believe in the, all the creeds and all the councils. And so that's why when first time I went to Greece, I, I kept going to these Greek Orthodox um, bookstores, and I kept asking for a Greek Bible. And I must have gone to 20 of them before I actually got somebody who understood what I meant. I said, like the New Testament, like God's Word, like the Bible, like, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like whatever. And they're like, do you want a philosophy book? No, 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 I want. And I knew enough Greek that I could actually say it all in Greek, and they just had no clue what I was talking about. Finally, I walked into one of them, and a guy says, he was a seminary student, which means different than our seminary students as well. And he said, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> and he went in the back room, and he came back about five minutes later, and he got this book with all dust in it. Is it this? And it was the Greek New Testament. And it was identical to the Greek New Testament that I had from my seminary days. It's exactly the same. I said, yes. I said, you're a seminary student. Do you not read this? No, I've never seen it really before. Um, because they're different. They, they just think different than us. And don't criticize them one way or another. Just They're different, right? But there's this rivalry, east and west. Who is the prime bishop? Do we think rationally? So the Western, of course, thinks about Christ in a certain way. The Eastern thinks about Christ in a different way. Western churches tend to have a cross. Eastern churches don't. They have. He is risen. So if you go to an Eastern Orthodox church in Rochester, New York, on the big wall, as you drive by, it says, He is risen. And you drive just a little bit later, and there's a big Western church, and it has a big cross. We focus on the crucifixion, they focus on the resurrection. So there'll be differences like that, okay? Uh, so that, the popular church, there were some changes. So having that all in mind, right, what do you expect from a popular or state church? What's going to happen? What if we could make Christianity the state church of the United States of America? Boy, now that would be great, Right? Our, church, our founding fathers of the United States didn't think that was a really good idea. All right, Here's what happened. On one side, there's syncretism. Okay? They, they're starting to mix because everybody goes to church. It's like in, in Africa, everybody went to church at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Everybody took communion. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Okay? So the church actually gained privilege you're not illegal. And the, if you're the leader of the church, you have more and more power. Instead of persecution, you have, I'm the bishop. And everybody's like, yes. They gained possession. The church became very rich. All right? They had now buildings, and they had bigger hierarchy and bigger organization and bishops and all that, so they became very rich. You gave to the church, and the church stored it away. The church actually became very worldly because everybody became a part of it. And when people become a part of it, they bring themselves, right? Wherever I go, there I am. And uh, when the world is a part of who you are, guess what? They're going to think worldly. They're going to act worldly. They're going to talk worldly. So the church actually, instead of being 
holy or distinct or unique, it became, you couldn't tell a Christian from a non-Christian if you tried. They, we all talk alike, live alike, think alike, right? Except there were differences, right? So it became very worldly. Um, evangelism actually decreased. If everybody in your village goes to church, you don't have to evangelize. Why would you do that? <laughs> They're all going to church every Sunday, right? And then doctrinal deviation grew, and a bunch of other things happened. You can only imagine if, if everybody in the United States went to church on Sunday morning, it's the official religion, the only way to power is to go through the church, all right? So it started out with the state recognizing the church and allowing it and being, promoting it even, whatever, to the church actually had the power. And for the state, if you're going to be the emperor, you better, you better listen to the bishop, right? So the, the power flipped, all right? So on one side, there's syncretism that you might think of the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13, you know, so guy went out and sowed wheat, and the enemy came, and he sowed tares, something that looks just like wheat, and what do you do with that, you know? You can't pull up the tares because you will ruin the wheat, so it's all mixed, you got to let it grow together. So if that were true, what do you think is going to happen? So let's imagine everybody in Sun City West came to New Hope Fellowship. We're all just one big happy family. And you ultimately know, well, they're not living godly lives, <laughs> you know. And, you know, the way to power and Possessions is to be the, the, the bishop, right? And on and on it goes. So what happened was there was enough people that said, this isn't good. Do you know what pure persecution does? It always purifies. You know what popularity always does? Waters you down. Just waters you down. After a while, you're no different than the world when you call yourself a Christian, Right? So some people were smart enough to see that. So on one side, there's this syncretism, and we're all one big happy family, and we all go to church, and we're all, you know, whatever. But some are saying, this is not good. And if you study the church history over that time, I mean, some of the things that shock you is how they live. They have concubines, and, you know, they're half the time they're drunk, and... I mean, it's like, these are the church leaders, right? And it gets even worse by the medieval times when the bishop of Rome and all of his followers, some of them are doing some of the crazy, like, you, no, they wouldn't do that, and they do. So what happens to the true believers are those who think, this is not good, right? So on one side, there's syncretism, but in response to that, there's separation, Okay. So what happens is some are saying, I, I can't be a part of that, <laughs> right? And so you can, you can study these. Uh, monasticism says to mono, to live alone. Asceticism says I got to deprive myself of all these possessions and wealth and whatever, right? So in response to this, here's what's happening to our church, I'm just going to pull out of it. I'm going to live alone. Uh, I'm not going to have all this money and stuff. That's all they live for is money and stuff. So I'm going to go the opposite extreme, right? Maybe one thing you learn from church history is balance is good, but typically we go right or left, right? Celibacy, all right, if you're really spiritual, you're celibate. There were hermits, which are people who live alone in the desert, one of them lived on a pole. Remember the guy from uh, Egypt? He lived on a pole for, I don't know, what, 30-some years? I always wonder how, not how he got his food, but how some other things happened. I just <laughs> couldn't quite figure that one out. I think 30 years he lived on a pole, and then everybody came to worship him, and then it turned around to be the opposite of what he was hoping to do. I'm going to live alone to be really spiritual and just only think about Jesus, and all these people came to see him, and it's like, all right, hey. There were cloisters, right? where you group together, and then they became what's called orders, like 
groups of cloisters or hermits or whatever would say, I, we all think alike, so let's be of the order of the Benedictines and the Augustinians, and the, there were all these orders that started. So they tried to separate. So if you go to Greece, some of you have been to Meteora. This is one of the places where they had the monasteries. But the original one, you see those carvings in the rock? <laughs> That's where hermits lived. And you, you, made your, you made your little hole there, and that's where you lived. And that made you spiritual. If you can live in a rock on the face of that, man, I think you're the most spiritual person in the world. Some of them were there. If you've never been there, it's a really an amazing place to go and see. Uh, this one here, the only way up is that rope that you don't really see, but there's a rope there. And the only way down, and you hope the guy who's cranking it at the top doesn't let go. <laughs> anyway, so, is it good or bad? And you can see that syncretism really wasn't good for a lot of reasons. But separation in that form probably wasn't good for some other kind of reasons. All right, So you could just list them all down. The good is the separation, it, it really was against worldliness. They said, this, this is not good. It did promote Bible study, many of the monasteries, and so they sat and read the Bible a lot. They still do, right? It promoted prayer, many of them prayed a lot, right? So those are all good things we would say. They, by the way, copied the scriptures. So that was good. And many of the manuscripts we have are because those people kept copying the scriptures, right? So that gave us today a, a, a great library of ancient manuscripts that give us confidence that the Word of God is what it is. Uh, it was good in the sense that it returned people from this hedonistic lifestyle of more, 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 you know, to a more of a frugal lifestyle. They may have overdone it. And they often did a lot of good things, like took care of the needy, like provided for the poor. Made they made good wine. <laughs> <laughs> they educated the uneducated. They actually did a lot of good things, right? You could do that. You could see that. But on the bad side, you could see um, they lived in a thing on the middle, of, on the side of a mountain or whatever, and thinking, this makes me spiritual, and that might have been a false hope, you know. Um, actually, they pulled themselves out of the world and were supposed to be salt and light in the world. So that might not be good. We, it, um, it actually fostered probably a spiritual pride. Guess what? I haven't eaten for three days. Y'all impressed? <laughs> I'm a notch above you boys, <laughs> you know, or a celibate or you name it. You know, there's a spiritual pride. So... It's like my Amish friends, when I surveyed in, in, in Indiana, there was a pastor, an Amish pastor. You know, they, I said, so why don't you have cars and tractors and all that? Well, pride, pride, pride. And I said, really? He said, but you know what? We have just as much pride in our horses as you have ever had in your tractors. Right? So having a horse or not having a horse doesn't really help you with that. I'm just proud of my horse. You're proud of your tractor, right? So it can foster a, 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 a false spirituality, if you would. It promoted um, your efforts, your good works, man's part of salvation. So there's a lot of bad things. There's a verse of Scripture, a couple of verses. Now, the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, that's celibacy, commanding to abstain from foods, that's asceticism, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. God has given us richly all things to enjoy. So you can see one side, we're just going to mix. <laughs> the other says we're going to separate. And probably both sides ended up like, no. You don't have to separate, but you shouldn't mix. I don't know how you do it. We're in the world, just not of the world. So you can understand that that's a little bit of what happened there. The, there was a corruption of the church on both sides. And the true church, what God wanted to be, probably wasn't as evident. 
Okay, so what happened? As a result of that, there were a lot of controversies. So I'd like to, like I said, here's a list of them and a chart of them and whatever. I'm just going to do three of them, and I, I just want you to understand it. In this time, Christianity as we know it had to hammer out and deal with issues, okay? So don't ever believe the lie that the liberals tell us that we created our doctrinal statements. We never did. Or we created the canon of Scripture. We never did. But in that early church, they had to figure out, okay, so it's Joe Schmo says this and Joe Schmo says that. We have to figure out who's right. So there were controversies and there were issues and they hammered out somehow creeds, confessions, through councils, etc., etc. As I will show you at the end, almost every council got it right. That's an amazing thing. The Council of Nicaea got it right. The Council of Constantinople got it right. But there were those who came in and said something, and you know that that doesn't sound right. So if I got up here Sunday and preached that Jesus really wasn't the Son of the Living God, you would go, I don't think that sounds right. I hope, right? <laughs> and then I'd get right out. <laughs> So you have to understand that some people were coming up with new explanations and they're like, that doesn't sound right. That didn't mean they created a new doctrinal statement. It's like, that doesn't sound like the one we've always believed from the apostles. So I'm just going to list three of them because they were very influential. And you maybe have heard of them, but they really did influence. Arianism said, was the, the question of Arianism is, is Jesus fully God as the Father is fully God? In other words, is Jesus the same De fully deity, just like the Father's fully deity, all right? So Arius, and almost all the church fathers, and this is, this is um, I didn't understand this, but all of them have a glow around them in their pictures. That's so that you know this is a saint. And if you saw all the pictures of Arius, just like if you saw all the pictures of Rich Van Heuklem, they would look alike, right? Not with the glow, but, <laughs> right? <laughs> Paul will always be bald. John will always be this way. So, so th they will be different pictures of him. So that when the monasteries and the people who paint him and all will, will all paint Arius or John or whoever it is, y you know, so it's like looking at different pictures of you, right? You look different, but you're, I know it's you, right? So if you know these pictures, you would look at that picture and say, that's Arius. Because it's a picture, a drawing, a painting of Arius. And also you'll notice they all almost always have Arius of Cyrene or Athanasius of Alexandria or Augustine of Hippo. Almost all the church fathers have something like that. So you know where they're from because there's more than one Arius in this place, right? So, um, and, and you'll see some dates. So Arius was trying to figure out who Jesus was. And to be honest with you, understanding who Jesus is is not as easy as you might think. Now, you and I believe the truth because it's in the Bible, and he's fully God and fully man, and I believe it well in my heart, but please explain that to me. <laughs> you know. So you can understand, it's, it's, they were hammering out, how can that be? I can understand him being fully God, I can understand him being fully man, but I can't understand him being fully God and fully man. Was he, you know, was he human or was he not human? Did... Did, you know, could he sin? Could he not sin? If he was human, how come he didn't sin? And on, you know, they had all that. So Arius said, "Well, my understanding is the son was created, and therefore is different in essence from the father." Okay, so you understand why he became a heretic. <laughs> he's not a saint, but that's what he's teaching, and it was very, very popular extremely popular in about 300 to 325, 336. Uh, so remember, 325 is the Council of Nicaea and Constant Constantine and all that. So he's teaching this because it makes sense. How could Jesus be fully God and fully man? How could that be? He's either one or the other, or half and half or something, you know, but he can't be both. So Jesus had to be created, and he was different in essence from the Father. That doesn't mean they didn't worship Jesus, but he was just different. You and I would quickly, immediately see that there's something wrong. Athanasius of Alexandria, who was uh, 
uh, a leader as well, said, whoa. <laughs> so he said, no, 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 no. The Son is eternal. So Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the eternal God. All right? So he didn't have, he wasn't have a starting point. He wasn't created. And he's therefore identical in essence with the, with the Father. Not from the Father. It should be with the Father. So we understand that he took what we would call the orthodox view, which is our view, right? Eusebius of Caesarea said, ah, I think we're in between there. <laughs> he's not created, or at least you're wrong, but he's also not identical in essence with the Father. I don't know why I have from in there, but it's with. And therefore, he is a likeness of the Father. All right? So now you've got three views and you got to hammer this one out. So they add what started, this is one of the first councils in 325, the Council of Nicaea. And whenever there's a council, there's like Council of Constantinople or whatever. It's a city that they met in. So they, you know, they brought in all the theologians and all the whatever and said, we've got to hammer this out. We've got to figure out who's right, who's wrong. And we've got we to gotta come up with a statement. So they came up, they, they hammered it out. Like I said, they almost always got it right. I'm just so amazed at it. Once they got it kind of neutral, but once all the other times they seemed to get it. And we still can quote the Nicene Creed. I'll just read part of it. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Begotten, not made, co-substantial, being of one substance with the Father. That means the same essence. And so they use words that maybe we don't use, like co-substantial or whatever, but if you understand what they're saying, they just nailed it. They got it right. All right? But you understand the issue was, was Jesus fully God? And the answer in Nicene Creed is, yes, he is. They would, if you read the Nicene Creed, you realize the third paragraph is, and I believe in the Holy Spirit and there's a lot more to it, but I just wanted you to see it. So that's one of the issues, one of the controversies to start. A little bit later, there's another issue, Apollinarianism. And this one is, what is the relation between the divine and human sides of Jesus? So it's a different question. So if he's fully God and fully man, explain that to me. What's that relationship? Could he sin? Did he sin? Um, when you see him in the Gospels and he's hungry, that's what people do. That's what men do. How could God be hungry? Explain that one to me. You know? So how do we explain the fully God, fully man thing? How do, we, how do we understand that? Is Jesus, so the first one is Jesus fully God. And Arius said, no, nah, he's a created being. He's a, you know, kind of a notch down. He's not really fully God. And this one, is he fully human? Because you would say, no, he couldn't be fully human because then he could sin and, you know, he, you know, whatever. So they had to deal with that. Apollinarius of Laodicea said he had a human body and soul, but the divine logos took the place of the human spirit so in his attempt to explain this, all right, he did have a human body, he did have a human soul, but somewhere in his life the divine logos took the place of his human spirit. So they believed in body, soul, and spirit, trichotomy, at least he did, and so the human spirit was replaced. In other words, Jesus was not fully human. He wasn't human like you're human. All right, he's close, but he was not quite the same. And you and I would say, oh, don't know about that one. So, in the Council of Constantinople of 381, they condemned him. And this is where now they are going to say, from this point on, he is full humanity and deity. He's fully God. He's fully man. And so you hear that statement often by us in our churches, right? Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of the eternal God, fully God, fully man, da-da-da-da. And we say that because we believe it, and it's true. He is absolutely 100% man and he's absolutely 100% God and it seems like he at 200% it can't be, it could be 50-50 but it couldn't be both, but it is and that council as well 
had a problem only in this. They didn't clarify the nature of his person. So they, they, as you see, these councils are answering issues that come up and, and, and controversies and deviation from truth that comes up. So they deal with it and they get it right. But there's other questions. Right? And the one they left hanging that they didn't deal with was the nature of his person. Right? So you're going to get that in a later one, but we're not going to go there. So those are two of them. There's another one I'd like you to see. Pelagianism, and the question of Pelagianism is what is the nature of man's sin? So all of these are named after a person, right? And they're always named after the person who came up with this new idea, right? This new understanding. So what is the nature of man's sin and man's salvation? So anybody here a Pelagian? Don't raise your hand. A semi-Pelagian, don't raise your hand. Or a Calvinist, don't raise your hand. Because this is very current. This is, all of these you know, seem to have been settled a long time ago, but this one's like very cur- current. So uh, in, our, in our American churches, there are many Pelagians, there's many semi-Pelagians, there's many Calvinists, right? So we have to understand what was going on in this one. What's the nature of our sin? And then, what's the nature of our salvation? Can you save yourself? Do you need God to save you? Does God totally save you and you don't have to do anything? Do you have free choice? Or is it preordained and you have no option in this? Or do you believe? Can you lose your salvation? Can you not lose your salvation? All of these questions are going on, right? And so, uh, this guy Pelagius comes up with an answer. So he's from Britain, so which tells you very early on Christianity was already in Britain. It is in India, it's in all of Europe, it's in North Africa, it's in Britain. And one of their theologians is this guy, Pelagius. Um, And he said, you know, man by nature and birth is alive and well. But when he first sins, so you're born, your little kid is born, he's alive and well, he's a great kid, he's basically good, and he doesn't lose his temper or anything like that, none of my kids did either, all right, so they're basically alive and well, and if he could just keep living that way, he'd be all right, he wouldn't need to be saved because he doesn't have any sin, by nature or by birth. But if he does sin, then he becomes a sinner. So you're not a sinner until you sin, all right? When you say, well, I don't know about that. Anyway, salvation is therefore a free choice that every individual makes. And when you choose to sin, you give up on it, and then you have to choose Jesus. And so it's all about free choice. And you can lose your salvation if you choose to. You can keep your salvation if you choose to. It's whatever. But the the key phrase, a man is live and well. Man is basically good until he sins. Augustine of Hippo said, oh, no, 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 (laughs) no. Man is dead in his trespasses and sin. He cannot be saved just by choosing it. He cannot be saved by never sinning. He's born a sinner. He is by nature a sinner. His heart is deceitful above all. So the only way he can be saved is for God to regenerate him. God make him alive. He needs to be born again. That's the only hope is man has to be born again. So one says man is alive and well, we're really good until we choose to make the wrong decisions. The other says, no, you're dead in your trespass and sin. And if God didn't save you, you wouldn't be saved. You know, not God needs, you need to be born again. You must be born again. There was another view called semi-Pelagius that a man is alive but he's not well. He's sick. So you see the three views. One is man is alive and well. Man is dead in his trespasses and sin. Man's alive, but he's pretty sick. Salvation is a sick man reaching out to God for help. So they had to sort through that. Is man by nature and by birth a sinner? The minute that baby is born, he's already a sinner. By nature, it's part of who he is. And it doesn't take too long for that to show up in when he throws a temper tantrum, right? Or he's a good kid. He's going to heaven until, you know, 
when he's six and he commits his first sin. And then you redefine sin to be not that you did something wrong. You redefine sin to be when you knowingly choose to do something wrong. So a kid laying on the table throwing a temper tantrum and his legs are flying like crazy, he's not sinning. He's just throwing his legs around real fast, right? It's when he's about six or seven, now he's going to personally choose to do what's wrong, what he knows is wrong, and then that's his first sin. So lying isn't wrong if you didn't intend to do it. And you're three years old and you lied to your mom and dad. That is not wrong. It's when you're six and you say, I'm going to lie. Watch this. Bam. Make a choice. You might think that is totally unrelated to reality, but that's still very prevalent in our sink. In our, I, always t I used to play softball a lot, and we were in a church league, and we had a church that believed people could get saved and then they'd be sinless. All right, I don't know if you've ever been part of that. They were good people, but I remember when they'd slide into second base and they get called out and they were convinced they were safe. They sometimes said some words that seemed to me to be sin. <laughs> and they seemed to have an attitude that seemed to me to be sin. And I remember, because I played second base sometimes, and I'd say, so you don't sin, huh? And the answer was, it wasn't sin. Because I didn't knowingly choose to do it. It was just a spontaneous reaction. When, you, when he called me out, I didn't sit down and say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to swear. You know? So you realize that they, they really believe they have never sinned because they didn't knowingly choose to do a wrong thing. It just, it just happened. <laughs> like, how can you blame me for that? Anyway, so there was a council of Ephesus in 431, and they took neither of them, but they were pretty orthodox. This is the one council that was a little bit off because they didn't fully go. But in the Council of Orange in 529, they condemned not only Pelagian, but the semi-Pelagian position, that man is not alive and well. He is not alive, but a little bit sick. <laughs> man is dead in his trespasses and sin. They have a few verses of scripture that might help you to support that, like Ephesians chapter 2. You who are dead in your trespasses and sin, you know. And so um, those are some of the councils. So you could look at all of them. They're up, some of them are up here. They came up with these councils. They came up with creeds like the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and da-da-da-da. Most of them are very orthodox. You will read them and go, right on. You nailed it. Got it. Many of them deal with who is Jesus? Is he fully God? Is he fully man? Is he both? How does that work? How can that possibly be? And some of them, you'll read them and like, I don't get it, right? Because you don't use their words, all right? And some of the words they use, I still don't get. But anyway, I wanted you to see this is all going on. The church is trying to figure out who they are, what they believe, and whatever. And that is why the Greek, the Eastern Orthodox, which includes Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox and Ukrainian Orthodox and all the Orthodox group, they tend to really hang on those Orthodox uh, creeds and councils. The Council of Constantinople said, the Council of Ephesus said, the Council of Nicaea said, uh, whereas we might say what well, the Bible says, um, but they would, they would say, we've been Orthodox since 33 AD and we haven't shifted and our councils have proved it in our catechisms and whatever. So that's, that's the controversies, okay? I want to just list some of the church fathers. Now, why do we use the word church fathers? I don't know, except that that's what everybody does. So we do what everybody does, right? <laughs> Here's the definition. The church father is an ancient, influential Christian theologian or writer who established the intellectual and doctrinal foundation of, the Christ of Christianity. So if you study um, church fathers, they tend to be the early church fathers, the ancient church fathers, and the maybe up to about 590 or so. After that, you don't seem to have any church fathers. We don't call them that anymore. But there are books of the writings of the church fathers. And so you have in the ancient or the early church fathers, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, you've heard that quoted many times, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, on and on it goes. Those are the early ones. But in this particular period, you're going to have a few of them. And most of them will have a halo or a picture that represents them. So if anybody who looked at that picture who understood this, this kind of thing, we tend not to have icons around, right? But if you go to some of their churches, they, 
they have icons or pictures. And, oh, there's John and there's, there's whatever. So John Christosom in 347 through 407, he's called the golden mouth because he was considered perhaps the greatest preacher of all time. He was just, he could just really preach apparently. He is noted for that. There is Jerome who you can see him writing. He translated the Hebrew and Greek into Latin, what we call the Vulgate, and that Vulgate is still around, although it's been updated somewhat, but the, the Latin Vulgate, so he's very influential got the, lang- the Bible into the language of the, La- of the Romans, right? The Latin Vulgate. Augustine of Hippo, one of the things that he did was also write a book entitled The City of God. You've heard his story. He, uh, he was kind of a wayward boy who had a mother who prayed a lot for him, right? And he did a lot of bad things along the way. And anyway, his mother kept praying, and one day he was saved. He was generous, genuinely saved. And uh, as a result of that, Uh, He became quite a theologian. He's considered one of the great theologians of the church over the period of time. But he wrote a book called The City of God. So if you understand the difference between premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial, he actually was the start of amillennialism. The City of God is amillennialism. So um, he was very, very influential. And the church from that point on pretty much abandons anything, you know, the, the church and the big picture abandons premillennialism. So premillennium was the, the thinking of the early church. By Augustine, it's thrown out, and not until after the Protestant Reformation did suddenly it gain some, some more power or whatever. Okay? There was St. Patrick. He was in Scotland, and he went to Ireland. So again, you see how far the Christianity has spread. Um, you have St. Leo I, who was the Bishop of Rome, and he's the first who assumed the title Papa or Pope. So now all of a sudden we're, he's not the Bishop of Rome, he's the, the Papa of Rome. He's the Pope of Rome. So that word is starting to come into, so that's 460, something like that. Then there's Gregory the Great, who is the founder of what we call papacy. All right, so it's been developing, been developing, and he's called Gregory the Great because he was pretty tough, strong uh, leader and person. And uh, from that point on, uh, almost every church historian will say the papacy is established. It's there. Leo used the term. Gregory, it's done. It's, it's a done deal. Okay? So, what are some conclusions? Here's just some. When persecution ended, doctrinal deviations within within became really great. Doctrinal truths were hammered out. Now we have Arius and Apollinarius and all these guys coming up with new things, teaching. So they had to have councils and creeds and hammer them out in the heat of controversy. So the statements that we often say, fully God, fully man, they they had to pound them out. (laughs) I can only imagine what it was like to go to the council of Constantinople with all these theologians pounding it out. And finally they wrote this little statement and, it, you know, they got it right. Major controversies tended to center on Jesus Christ because it's hard to explain the person of Christ is not simple to understand. Is he fully God? Is he fully man? Is he part and part? Is he this, that, whatever? Uh, how about his nature? Could he have sinned? You know, on a, those are not easy to understand. So they tended to be that. And Ar- Arius, by the way, is still around is still a very prominent Apollinarianism is still around. It's in different forms today. You don't know it like that. Um, some of them are like Jehovah's Witnesses and whatever. But it's not easy. The councils tended to come to the right conclusions. And error often started when sincere men were seeking truth or trying to protect from error. All right. So many of them were sincere, but they were trying to, to get it. And they ended up getting it wrong yeah, or, or whatever. All right, those are just some conclusions I think you can do. Why don't you give me a couple, and then I got another list. The popular church, good or bad? Would you rather be in the persecuted church or the popular church? Where do you think error comes in the most? Where do you think evangelism happens the most? Where do you think? 
purity comes the best, you know? Church history helps us to answer that because we've seen it happen, <laughs> you know? We've seen a church persecuted and you couldn't stop it from growing. We saw it when it was popular. Oh, sure, they had a lot of big buildings and everybody went to church. Everybody got baptized when they were a little baby, by the way. In this period, this one, um, Augustine and others introduced uh, baby baptism because, uh, and Pelagianism f fed into that, even though Augustine was the opposite of that, all right? So a lot of things are happening, all right? All right, so let me just say, this is B.K. Kuyper, page 44. By the end of the 5th century, here's some things that have now are part of the church. Prayer for the dead. Belief in purgatory. Lent is 40 days. The Lord's Supper is no longer an ordinance, it's a sacrament. Only priests can administer communion. There's a growing division between clergy and laity. There is the veneration of martyrs and saints. So we have the icons, and if you've ever been to the Orthodox churches in particular, the icons are very valuable, all right? Generally with goat, and I mean, it's not just a picture of John. It's a, the adoration of Mary as the mother of God phrase is used in the queen of heaven. They started to burn tapers and candles in their services. Uh, there was the veneration of relics, images, altars. The clergy started to wear vestments, and they kept getting grander and grander and grander. And there was more ritual and less preaching. And so that's from B.K. Kuyper. His list actually goes longer than that. One of the interesting things Kuyper does is shows you um, where... When did purgatory start? And he clearly shows you this was not even thought about to hear, and then all of a sudden it was officially accepted as a doctrine or a teaching by the church in this year. When did, uh, you know, 40 days of Lent, he has them all down, so he shows you when they all came. It kind of amazes you how late they came. Many of them came into the official position of the church, all right? Here's another thing. Amillennials became very popular, the city of God, we're, we're going to, there's no millennium coming. We're just going to do it here. Baptism is a key to salvation, placing the child into the covenant community. Apostolic succession. So the apostles passed on. Peter passed it. He was the bishop of Rome. He passed it to this guy, to this guy, this guy. In 445 AD, the emperor officially recognized the primacy of the bishop of Rome. He was the first among equals. They developed seven sacraments. A Sunday became the official day of rest for the kingdom, for the, for the empire. And an interesting one, they said, we're going to observe Christ's birth on December 25. And if you know anything, the Eastern Church says, no, 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 no. It's January, what is it, 6 or something like that? What is it? Six. Is it 6? Something like that. So things like that are happening, all right? What do we learn about persecution and popularity from them? Well, you learn a lot. I don't want to be persecuted, do you? Can't imagine that being much fun. But it might have some good event, impact on, our, on my life. It might actually purify me. It might give me incentive to evangelize more than ever. It might drive me to depend on God more than ever before, right? It might have some good impact, but I don't choose it, and I don't want it, and hopefully I don't have to live with too much of it. But it seems to have had some pretty good impact. Popularity, I love that. I love to walk in a room and everybody says, I'm with you, man. We're all Christians here. That's great. Let's do it. I don't have to have evangelism, right? Evangelize, whatever. But we do learn some things that we studied last week. There's always the dangers of wolves, persecution, worldliness. Yet Christ is always building his church. Christians are always standing for truth. And Christians are always witnessing. So it may seem like uh, the whole flow of the church has shifted by the end of the uh, 590, but there's still great believers in Jesus Christ doing the right thing, believing the right truth, right? You can never, but somehow that doesn't, that's, that's a part of church history that really bugs me. The good guys never get recorded, <laughs> you know? 
some little old lady in Ephesus who's praying well and winning people to Christ. She never makes the books, but Arius does, you know, whatever. So it was uh, Carolyn Ahrens, who some of you know, is the story, of Christ- the story of Christianity ultimately leaves me shocked at the risk God takes with humans. Even the greatest lives in church history were dishearteningly imperfect. Luther attacked the Jewish faith. Swingley endorsed execution of Anabaptists, right? And you can go down the list. As you study church history, you realize God, God actually took some risk. He said, we're going to use you guys. <laughs> and quite a few of us aren't perfect. And some of us are more imperfect than others. And Luther, you could find a lot of flaws in him, but I could tell you there's a lot of good in him. And, but don't ever think he was perfect. And Swingley, don't ever think he was perfect, but he sure did a lot of great things. Okay. Here's the last thing. The church grew when it took the Great Commission seriously. When it counted not their lives dear. They grew because in the persecuted era, they had answers to the world around them. The world is trying to figure this out. How come our families are breaking up and hating each other and we, you know, so-and-so won't talk to his dad and, Nana, and you guys? Like, how does that work? And the church had moral qualities uh, attractive to many. You might think being holy and morally pure doesn't attract the world, but there's something about it. Just talk to employers. Do you want to hire somebody who's going to steal from you? Or somebody who's honest? You want to hire somebody who always comes in drunk? Or doesn't? You want to hire somebody who respects you and your authority because you're the boss or somebody who lips off to you all the time, <laughs> kicks you, you know. What do you want? And I know this was true about your kids. It was true of the kids. I, we were very privileged. My kids were teens at a church in Rochester, New York, and our youth group was strong, and like we had a lot of kids, and, and, and they were great kids and great families. And all of our kids got jobs at Wendy's and Burger King and... You know, and one day I said to the guy who hired one of them, I said, why do you hire our kids all the time? He said, if they go to your church, I hire them without even interviewing them. I know they will show up on time and they'll work till they're done. I know they won't steal from me. I know they won't lip off to me. And I know they'll work hard. That's all I want. <coughs> and, and the world sees that. And we have to understand that. They might seem like they don't like us because we're prudes and we don't do bad things and we don't go where they go and don't say what they say and don't whatever. But the truth is the opposite. F.F. F. Bruce said, when we try to account for the increase in the numbers, in spite of a hostility, we must give due consideration to the impression that behavior of this kind would have made on a pagan population. They couldn't understand these Christians. They just couldn't understand. They were honest. They were nice. <laughs> they loved one another. They cared for the poor. And the list goes on. Hopefully we're that. Let's pray. Father, today I thank you for this period um, and our understanding of it. And I know, Father, that none of us would ever, in a sense, personally want persecution. I wish everybody in America was a Christian. <coughs> I wish we were indeed a Christian nation in in every sense of that term. But Father, I pray that you'd help us to realize that it often in the times when we are popular that we drift. Life's too easy. I don't know what it is. So I pray even as we think of our country and we think of some of the things that are happening and we, we sense that persecution is here and is coming in greater forms uh, and we might fear it. I pray, Father, you'd help us to realize it may be the best thing for us. It may, be, it may be your way to reach more people for Christ. I don't know. But we, we pray that we'd study church history and learn from it. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go be popular. Here's some charts. <laughs> and if you need some more,